Welcome back. This is Reading Adam with another review of a book I recently read by Ray Bradbury called the uh, called Dandelion Wine. I almost said the dandelion wine, but no, it's Dandelion Wine. The book is about it was a first of all it was a very good book. It's a short book. Um, it's about home. It, Ray Bradbury's hometown, which he renamed to Greentown. It, I think it's in Illinois, and uh, that's a fictional name for a real town, and it takes place setting as the 1930s. Um, it's about this hometown, multiple characters in the hometown. Primary character is Douglas. He's a young boy, and I think he ages a few years into like a preteen, but maybe not. Um, it's it's hard to tell. I think there's a passage of time, but it's not it's not really integral to the story. Uh, the plot is not like a build up to a climax and then suddenly you know everything falls together and then there's a clear conclusion. It's an old. I think the classics from the 1900s and then maybe early 20th century tended to have. <clears throat> follow multiple characters and have a plot that was just a structure of, of multiple plots as an expression of this author's idea of, of whatever question or whatever thing they were talking about. And then in this case, in Dandelion Wine, it was about memories and hometown. Particularly, you, you think of your own hometown when you're reading this book. So, I mean, that's what I thought of. I thought about my own hometown, the town I grew up in, a uh, small town, small country town, similar to the one in in the book. However, in, it was the 1990s, so uh, a good amount of time passed between this hometown and this other one. But you can see how probably when this book was published, uh, any folks of the greatest generation probably would would think of you know it probably appealed to them um, because it would have been their childhood in the 30s that would have been uh, memorable to them and the kinds of people who are who are there uh, interesting characters uh, I find the book the book deals with the whole range of of age in characters so there's there's quite a few like it seems rare for me to find a book where there's actual elderly people in it and uh i think ray bradbury captured the essence of an elderly person in a town like this quite well and and it really made them real characters not just boring old people that drone on endlessly about stories in fact a few characters i forget the name of a character but one character is basically in love with this 90 year old woman and because he found a picture of her when she was young and he was looking for her but she was old by the time um, he learned that this person was 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 real but wasn't young anymore <clears throat> but he he would he really enjoyed talking to her. She had been all over the world. She had done many things, and they just he just sat and listened and talked with her about anything and everything. And it was it was a very respectful view of old people. There's another character, Colonel Freely. I did re I do remember his name. Colonel Freely was alive during the Civil War and and talked about to the boys. He talked about his adventures um hunting buffalo on the plains and uh, when they still existed and and uh fighting indians and and the civil war general lee abraham lincoln <clears throat> these characters were fresh and alive to him now that's an interesting thing because uh the characters for instance, and this is one of the points I want to make, Colonel Freely, when he dies, so uh, Bradbury makes a point about how he didn't just die. He, 
Abraham Lincoln died, General Lee died, the Buffalo died, the, those Indians died, and all of the things that were that guy's memories that were still alive and existed through him died with him. And that got me thinking about, you know, it's a sad memory particularly of myself with a roommate. I had a roommate in college and he died in a car accident um, during the summer. I only heard about it during the summer, so I obviously never saw him again after after our one semester or two semesters of living together in a dorm. Now, all of his memories and knowledge died with him, but he and I did certain things that were just our memory, just he and I, just the two of us, our memory. Um, for instance, the, the times that we walked together to the theater, um, certain discussions we had, certain movies and video games we played together, certain, you know, one, one fight that we had, and one time when we scaled a wall to get to Walmart, and uh, there are other things that we did. But when I die, that all of that will be completely and forever gone. Like, he still partially exists in my memory today because I can talk about him. I can, I can inform you or I can inform anyone else of, of his existence and things that we did and his personality. But when I die, there's nothing left for that. There's, there's nothing. I mean, there's other people who knew him, but, but through me, that link is closed off. It's forever gone. So it, that's, that's an interesting thing to think about and to ponder is, is this idea of um, when you perish, so too does everything you know perish with you. A, a few examples I can give. Uh, a professor once remarked that in some Eastern culture, when, when, a pers when an old person dies, a library burns. Again, when an old person dies, a library burns. Because it's true, people can hold tons of information and knowledge in their mind, but when they're gone, they're gone. So write down what you know. Uh, that's that's part of the importance of writing and then reading those writings is you're you're reading you're that's somebody's way of transmitting and carrying on beyond their death. Um, even videos like this, uh, long after I pass, maybe this video will still be out there. Who knows? But another quick example I can give of that is uh, Murray Rothbard, and I've read most of his books, and he was writing an economic history through the perspective of the Austrian School of Economics. And he had two volumes out, and then he had... Um, Lou, Rock, Lou, Lou Rockwell uh, mentioned that he knew that Murray Rothbard had the third volume in his mind. Like he already had it planned out and written in his mind. It just was the matter of writing it out in reality. But when he died, so too did that third volume. It, it perished. Um, that's the importance of trying to get things written down. And obviously there are ways that, that you can't, you can't fully complete that, but it's, um, it's a lot of food for thought. Think about it yourself. Think about certain, certain characters, people or yourself or people, you know, in your life and how, when, how their memories are related with death. Now I'm not discussing this as well as I would like to, but it's, because it's, it sparked some thinking, but I'm not quite, uh, I don't have it quite fleshed out yet. But uh, going, going back to hometown, when you read this book, you'll think of your own hometown, um, especially if you grew up in a smaller town, which when he was writing, a lot of Americans were, were living in small towns. And, and linking the hometown with memory, um, 
things change in your hometown. Some things don't change, like physical features might not change. So in this town, there's a ravine, and to that day, the ravine is the same. But, you know, homes get demolished, rebuilt, um, Main Street gets refurbished uh, or changes, new roads, there's new construction. I mean, the, the little town that I'm in right now has already changed somewhat since I've been here in, in that certain businesses have moved, certain businesses have came and gone, uh, new subdivisions have gone up, uh, things of that nature. You don't quite get it. I haven't quite seen or felt a big sense of loss in this town yet because it's, it's, it's growing. However, uh, the town that I grew up in, which is every time I drive through it now, I'm like, oh, that wasn't, this is much more grown up than when I grew up in this town. It seems more populous. There's more commercial buildings. That's the big thing I noticed. But but one thing that sticks out is the grocery store that I worked in as a teenager. So this grocery store, is it only exists in my memory now. It's gone. It's demolished. Uh, a few years after I went off to college, um, I didn't work there anymore, and it only lasted a couple years because Walmart came, uh, first Tops, and then Walmart came, and this little grocery store couldn't compete. So it couldn't compete, and then the building was up for sale, and I, not I had noticed that driving through the town once, uh, that it was up for sale, and then like a year or two later, I drove through the town again, and it was gone that building was gone completely. And there was a little drugstore next to it too. And that was also gone. And it was just a parking lot. Well, first it was just demolished, um, broken, uh, like, like nothing, not like almost like a vacant lot. And then I went there later on and now it's a parking lot for, a new building that's the town public library so the town now has so there's a building there that's probably going to be there for a very very long time the, the town public library and that grocery store is is gone permanently gone um anybody moving into town now they'll have no idea that that was ever there they'll have no idea that was ever there and and that's kind of an interesting thought. People who've grown up there, they see the changes and they can they have the memory of what used to be there. Uh, but anybody new doesn't have that memory. Like every time you you go to you move to a new place, uh, you're completely ignorant of of how that place was before. Is that a big deal? No, I don't think it's a big deal. But it's just an interesting thing to think about how, how landscapes and, and things change over time and only live as ghosts in our memory. And there's, there's another point that Ray Bradbury makes about that in Dandelion Wine. So that point being, let's see if I can just get the point out. The point is you are, uh, those memories they're nice, but they don't exist anymore. Those things don't exist. So you don't you don't need to keep holding on to them. And one example he gives is is a an old woman in his book. He's she's talking with young girls, and the young girls don't believe that the old woman was ever young like those girls are. She was trying to convince them that she was young and that she was young like them once and even like showed them a picture of herself and was trying to show them like a dolly she had and, and a dress and and the little girls just wouldn't believe her they wouldn't believe her at all and it made the old woman upset and and the little girls stole something from her that was hers as a child and and ran away with it and the old woman who was a widow at this point she had a discussion in in her mind, after the kids left, she, she thought in her head, she was having a discussion with her deceased husband who was taking up the viewpoint that that um, that little girl doesn't exist anymore, that he was reminding his wife that 
you are not that person anymore. You're not that little girl. You are an old woman. You are who you are in the present. You're not your childhood self anymore. Um, that person's gone. They're in those possessions, the things that you have that remind you of who you once were. Well, this old woman got rid of them because she she knew that she was not that person anymore. And I think one thing I'm going to try to do in the future is try uh, with future videos is try to have uh, maybe I'll do a, a, a reading of those particular sections that that stand out to me because that might make better sense of what I'm trying to say. But I'm doing the the um, SQ3R, which is survey question, read, recite, review. I'm doing the review portion, so I'm I'm from taking from memory, reviewing the book, and it it it, it was just interesting to me that that it was profound actually uh, this thought she had about how she was not this person anymore um, she's not the little girl anymore and why hang on to these things these relics that remind her of a time that's gone forever like she can't go back what's the point of thinking back uh, because it's so far back and nobody everybody who looks at you especially if they didn't know you then and most of the people that knew you then are probably deceased um, you can see the kind of the fruitlessness of it and you know does it needing to let that go and just live in the present i think that's a point he's trying to make in there letting let you know these memories are wonderful things and the dandelion wine itself is a product that uh, one household, Douglas's household, uh, they make dandelion wine every summer and they drink it during the winter. And, and when they drink the dandelion wine, it's, it's the memories of summer. So the memories of summer, um, it's interesting. The, so the dandelion wine is basically a metaphor or, or an object for memory a memory aid uh, to help them through a miserable time in comparison because uh, Douglas, he's this interesting guy. He's this interesting character. He records his memories of things in turn. And, and the way he does is he's like, I've hopped 460 fences in my lifetime. Like he, he marks down the number of times he's done things uh, like uh, I've crawled under a fence 312 times. I've sneezed, 8,000 times, uh, you know, um, I've picked 400,000 dandelions. It, I, I'm making those up, but that, that's basically what he was doing. He was listing specific things he was doing. And one thing that made me think of is how rich all of our lives have been. You Like, you think back on your life, your childhood, your hometown. You're thinking back your, your memories because you're getting a lot of almost nostalgia through this book. And you're, you're realizing how rich your life has been, how many things you have done. Like, well, what if you were like Douglas and recorded the amount of times you did things? And um, you, I think if you, if you think about that, the amount of times that I have uh, driven a car, the amount of times that I have set the dinner table or... Um, amount of times I've fallen over in a chair, silly things, but you realize you there's so much to your life. There is so much richness and fullness in your life. If you dwell on, if you, if you think about even these mundane things that you've done, all of these actions and things that you have done through your life and taken that, that kind of appealed to me. That was, that was very appealing because it reminded me that, you know, it, on the one hand, if you're always looking to the future and you're always thinking, you're always looking forward to making more money or being more successful or being a, a better version of yourself, well, you're kind of forgetting about the richness of what you've already lived and what you've already, how you've already went from how you were as a child to how you are today. So I think that's, that's a fascinating thing to think about it kind of gives you a little bit of peace with your past, peace with your memories. I, I think that was an interesting, 
interesting uh, thing that reading Dandelion Wine kind of brought up to me. Um, one thing I had written down, uh, the little girl she, she was might as well have never existed, at least in the present. No sense in keeping that idea to herself. Uh, that's what the old old woman who realized she wasn't that little girl anymore. Um, there's, I think there's a lot to explore in this book. And I think, I mean, I read Fahrenheit 451. That was my first introduction to Dan, uh, Ray Bradbury. This is the second book by Ray Bradbury I've read. And I'm, I'm pleased and happy to find out that there's two more books in this Dandelion Wine series. I don't know if they're... It's not like a trilogy or anything, I don't think. But two other books that take place in the same town, I think, have some of the same characters. Um, there's other interesting things that happen in the book. Uh, some some parts are are more interesting, I thought, than others. There's a there's a brief murder mystery bit, uh, and and following a woman who's terrified of this murderer going after her. There's a brief bit about a woman who wants to be elected to the head of her little ladies group and, and how another lady was using witchcraft against her. There were bits and pieces of the book that I didn't really care for. And I felt were a little bit out of place. Um, I believe the next book is called something wicked this way comes. And I do want to read that one. And depending on how that one goes, I'll read the, the third and last one. I've got them all on my phone. Uh, again, I had to find this book, to put on my phone because it's it's out of print it seems lost and forgotten but i don't think it should be i think dandelion wine could very easily be a high school book to be read and studied and thought about because it might arm kids a little bit better with a look at all the stuff you've done remember your memories maybe write down things about that you loved about summer like douglas first thing he does in the summer i don't know if it's the first thing literally but one of the first things he does is he gets a new pair of shoes and that's that like kicks off his summer form he he puts away his old dirty winter boots and gets a new pair of sneakers and i remember as a kid loving getting a new pair of sneakers and i normally got nine new pair of sneakers right before school i didn't get it in the summer but I, I, I can understand the feeling that he had about these sneakers. And and there's a good good passage there when he's buying the sneakers from an old old store man. And, and it, if you're a salesman, you should read that passage because the kid basically sells the pleasure of these sneakers. And and I can't I can't recreate that because I'm not a, a classic author. It's it's much better written in my opinion than Fahrenheit 451 was. Uh, Fahrenheit 451 was okay. I, I just didn't care for it. It just wasn't my cup of tea. I, I didn't like... It wasn't my, my taste. But Dandelion Wine was... I was a bit iffy because of four, Fahrenheit 451. But I, I read Dandelion Wine, and it was really good. So I encourage you, read Dandelion Wine, find it, and, and download it, and... Put it on your phone. Put it on your Kindle. Read this wonderful book. It's very short. Read it in the summer. Make your own dandelion wine if you live in an area with dandelions. I'm. I have uh, some that are bottled up right now, and I made dandelion wine at the beginning of the summer, <clears throat> and I'll be opening it up uh, around Thanksgiving time, and that'll be nice. Um, subscribe, like this video, share it with your friends, uh, leave a comment below. Again, this is Reading Adam, and take care. Bye.